Can you please help me give a very warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer Morse? Oh, mercy. That thing's demonic. The Ruth Institute is an international interfaith coalition to defend the family and build a civilization of love, as you just heard. Now, what I'm going to talk with you about today, my overall theme is to talk to you about what I call the sexual constitution. That is, the rules of the game by which Everybody's supposed to have sex and reproduce, okay? So we can understand something that we could call the Christian sexual constitution. That is, in a Christian society, there's a certain set of rules about who's supposed to have sex, who's supposed to have babies, what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to treat your spouse, and so on, right? That Christian sexual constitution has pretty much been obliterated. We no longer live under those rules anymore. We now live under what we could call the sexual revolutionary sexual constitution. So here's the thing, y'all. Here's the thing. We have lost this piecemeal. We have lost the elements of the Christian civilization piecemeal. We've been nickeled and dimed to death. I don't know how we're going to get it back, but we probably won't get it back piecemeal. I don't know how this is going to happen, right? But I know it won't happen unless we have a clear idea of where we're going and what we're trying to get, okay? So the two parts of my presentation, first of all, I'm going to spend some time explaining what the sexual revolution is, what that sexual revolutionary constitution looks like. And then towards the end, in the last five minutes or so, I'm going to give you a summary statement of the Christian sexual constitution. So you have it real clear in your mind what it is we're aiming for. So first part, understanding the sexual revolution, okay? So now if you ask yourself, what is happening in our culture? It doesn't that feel like sometimes you're being bombarded from all sides, you know, whether it's gay marriage, whether it's drag queen story hour, whether it's transgenderism, it's like it's, like it's banning us all over the place. And so it appears to be just kind of one thing after another randomly. But in point of fact, it's all one thing. It's all one giant thing. It's the sexual revolution. And I call this tree the rotten fruit of the sexual revolution. All those images, all those little blobs on the screen for before are now on this tree, okay? And you can see they're all there, cohabitation, abortion, medical complications from contraception and abortion, all these things that seem unrelated, they're all the fruit of this one tree, the sexual revolution. This tree, in my telling of it, has three major branches, what I call the contraceptive ideology, the divorce ideology, and the gender ideology, which I'm going to go through for you. The three big ideas of the sexual revolution are those three ideologies, and they can be summarized this way. The sexual revolution holds that a good and decent society should do everything possible to separate sex from babies. Y'all recognize that, don't you? Right? That is the contraceptive ideology. You can have all the sex you want without ever having a baby, unless you happen to have quirky lifestyle preferences, and then maybe you can have one, maybe two, but don't do anything crazy, right? That's the contraceptive ideology. The second ideology, or branch of the sexual revolution, if you like, is, is, what, is that a good and decent society should do everything possible to separate both sex and babies from marriage. So you don't have to be married to have sex. You don't have to be married to have a baby. You don't have to have sex when you're married. You don't have to have babies when you're married. It's all separate, okay? We call this the divorce ideology, okay? And it refers to anything that separates children from their parents, okay? Um, and then the third idea is that a good and decent society should hold, should believe, should teach, preach that the sex of the body is insignificant. And therefore, we can overwrite the sex of the body if we want to. And under some circumstances, we positively should overwrite the sex of the body. That is what I refer to as the gender ideology. Now, at the root of this tree is one fundamental idea, which is also a tacit promise, 
Okay, so here's the tree, here's the whole tree with the three branches, okay? At the base of all of them is one idea. You can do anything you want sexually and nothing bad will happen. Nothing bad will happen to you. Nothing bad will happen to people around you. you can do anything you want, nothing bad will happen. This is one of the crucial ideas of this presentation because if you see that this is what you're dealing with, you'll realize this is in, implicitly a promise um, and also has a whole theory behind it, okay? It, it has a whole statement of what the real world really is behind this idea. This promise makes the sexual revolution intrinsically seductive. Why? Because everybody wants to believe it. Everyone wants to believe that you can do anything you want. You got a sexual urge, you can scratch that itch and nothing bad's gonna happen, okay? Everyone wants to believe it. If you do not deliberately and intentionally resist the sexual revolution, you will be swept away by it. And if you look around our society, you'll see churches, schools, religious bodies, whole denominations, kind of going with the flow. And when you go with the flow, you're gonna end up in the sexual revolution. You're gonna end up, you're gonna be swept away by it. So you have to have it in your mind that you must resist it actively and intentionally, okay? So that's one of the important points about this promise. The other point is that whenever you're debating somebody about any of the issues on the screen, any of the issues we're gonna be talking about you know, over the course of this day, this is what you're asking them to give up. You're asking them to give up the promise that they can do whatever they want and nothing bad will happen, okay? So that's why they're hanging on to it. So if you have that in your mind, I think it will help you, right? Because honestly, have you ever heard anybody just blurt this out like this? You can do anything you want, it'll be fine. No, they don't ever blurt it out because it'd be obvious it's stupid, right? But if you press them, this is where they always end up. The other thing I'm just gonna briefly mention um, is that there is a tacit theory behind this of what it means to be a human being, what will make people happy, right? And um, what is the purpose of the state? Why do we have a government in the first place, okay? And so I would like to just mention to you my view, my theory about where we are and what this means. What is the purpose of the state? Perhaps some of you thought that the purpose of the state was to protect people from force or fraud. Perhaps you thought that the purpose of the state was to provide for the common defense or promote the general welfare. That is so five minutes ago, y'all. The purpose of the state is to give us the sexual lives we want with a minimum of inconvenience. That is the purpose of the sexual state. That's what it's doing. You wanna have sex and not have a baby? That's okay, we'll give you contraception at no cost to you. You use your contraception, you still get pregnant, you don't want the baby, that's okay, that's inconvenient for you, we'll let you have an abortion. Those obligations you have to your spouse and children, that's inconvenient, we'll give you a no-fault divorce and nothing bad will happen. You're in a relationship with a person of your same sex and you wanna have a baby? That's really inconvenient, but don't worry. We'll rearrange the legal system. We'll give you, we'll subsidize the technology so you can have all the babies you want without ever even having to lay eyes on your child's other parent. This is the sexual state. And we are now living in the sexual state. I'm going to skip over the contraceptive ideology. I have 45 minute talks on each of the three ideologies. I'm gonna skip over the contraceptive ideology because most pro-life apologetics in effect is dealing with the contraceptive ideology. I wanna spend more of my time on the divorce ideology and then also the gender ideology. The divorce ideology because nobody ever talks about it and the gender ideology because this is the issue that's on everybody's mind. So when you get the slides, if you're interested in learning more about any of these ideologies, you can just click on these things and you'll, and you'll be taken to a lot of, uh, way a lot of information about it. So let's talk about the divorce ideology. The divorce ide ideology behind it, when you say that sex and babies can and should be separated from marriage, what you're really saying is the kids don't need their parents. Kids don't really need their parents. And so when the Ruth Institute talks about uh, the divorce ideology, we don't mean just divorce, we also mean anything that separates a child from one of their parents. 
including uh, third-party reproduction, including unmarried parenthood, anything except an unavoidable tragedy that separates children from one of their parents. In a room this size and this demographic, I am sure that there are some of you who have already experienced the divorce ideology. Some of you have already experienced multiple divorces, the divorces of your parents. I know that. 750 people of this generation, yeah, it's out there. So, I want you to know I'm talking to you. This little chart here shows some of the well-documented risk factors that children of divorce face. These are all things that are statistically more likely to happen to children who are separated from their parents through divorce, okay? Uh, and no one disputes this. As a matter of fact, a friend of ours, Dr. Pat Fagan, did a report some years ago, 40 pages, closely typed pages, 330 footnotes, and all of it points to the same thing, that children are negatively impacted by divorce. No serious person denies this. No one, everyone knows it. I don't care what they say in public, they all know, okay? So the question is why? What, what is it that's making this divorce experience so difficult and problematic for children? I'm gonna tell you just a couple uh, short stories. The kids absolutely are not resilient, and some of you already know that. I have a friend, former colleague, named Jennifer. Her parents divorced when she was three. She has exactly two photos of herself with both parents. Her parents, both of them went on to remarry. Her mom had children with the other, with the, with the new spouse. And Jennifer had to move from one house to the other every week. Her half-sister did not have to move the house every week. Her half-sister got to be with both parents all the time. At her mom's house, the half-sister got to have photos on the wall that included both sides of the family. All the relatives, both sides of the family. No pictures of Jennifer's dad or the other side of her family. At, the, at dad's house, the opposite is true, okay? This experience of going back and forth week after week, no, seeing that your half-sibling has something that you don't have, this takes a toll on the child's heart. The child feels like a leftover from a previous relationship. Okay, that is, that is part of the divorce experience that is so taxing for kids. Another story, this, this is not about ch children, this is about a woman close to my age, a woman in her 50s, a respected woman, her parents, do, a, a professional woman, all, has it all together kind of a person, right? Her parents divorced when she was five. She came to me one day practically in tears. I said, Amanda, what's wrong? She said, well, my father is dying and my stepmother will not allow me and my sisters to go see him and be with him. This should not be happening, and there is nothing in no-fault divorce that prevents it from happening. Now, I know it's not every story is as bad as that. I know that. But the fact is there's nothing in the logic of no-fault divorce that presents this. I want you to know today that I will never accept this as normal. I don't care how often it happens. I will never say it's okay. It is not okay. It is fundamentally unjust to children. Now, let's talk briefly about the gender ideology. Like I said, this is what's on everybody's, <laughs> on everybody's mind. When I was a young person your age, the, the thing was feminism, and we were all taught tacitly that men and women are identical, except women are better. Yeah. <laughs> right? So the, you, you know what I'm talking about here. Okay. So this is the early form of feminism. And so therefore, it's, a, we, it's mandatory, socially mandatory, that we wipe out all the differences between men and women, right? We need to overwrite the differences that flow from the body that have to do with sex roles and income and all those other things. That's what feminism taught us. The new gender ideology still has this kind of wiping out differences between men and except the ones people specifically choose to bear. And goodness knows, you know, if your little boy picks up a doll for five minutes, he's probably really, truly a girl. This is the new gender ideology. Now, it sounds crazy, and a lot of people ask me this, Dr. Morris, how does this even work? What are they even thinking? Well, these two things fit together in the following way. They both hold that the human body is unimportant and can be transcended. 
We can overwrite the body. In fact, not only can we, but we should. If the sex of the body interferes with an important social goal, like equality, then we must overwrite the sex of the body. And this is what feminism basically held. Our big goal is equality, so therefore we got to do everything we can to make everybody equal, even if it means pretending that girls and boys like sports the same amount and we go around shutting down men's wrestling programs so that there aren't too many boys doing that unequal thing there, you know? And now, with transgenderism, um, the, the sex of the body interferes with your personal autonomy. You want to be a thing, your body's in the way, therefore it is mandatory that we overwrite the body, the reality of the body. That's how these things fit together. And behind it all is a discomfort with the body itself, with the sexed nature of the body. That is what's got people freaked out. So I want to point out to you that the sexual revolution pivoted to transgenderism very quickly after gay marriage was enacted by the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, and this is something for you to have in the back of your mind, maybe in the front of your mind, depending on who you're talking about and what you're thinking about. But here's the thing, I interviewed a guy, um, and if you click on this screen here, if you click on that book, it'll take you to the interview. I interviewed one of the attorneys who argued gay marriage at the US Supreme Court. And he said to me that after, after the court handed down its decision, very quickly, his caseload filled up with transgender cases. Within weeks, 90% of his cases were trans cases. He's like, what the heck is going on? So I did a little checking, and it turns out that on June 26, 2015, that is when the Supreme Court announced gay marriage. June 26th, okay? On June 25th, the July issue a Vanity Fair appeared and it had Bruce Jenner on the cover. The day before Obergefell. Now, if maybe that's a coincidence, you think, but on July 15th, 2015, the first episode of I Am Jazz appeared. You guys all are familiar with I Am Jazz? That's what Jazz and his mom looked like at the height of his fame. And this is what Jazz looks like today after his surgery and everything else, okay? He looks awful in my opinion, okay? But here's the point. Here's the point. Just look at the sequence. On the 25th, we've got Vanity Fair putting Bruce Jenner on the cover. On the 26th, the Supreme Court tells us that um, man-woman marriage is uh, prohibited, basically, right? That is, uh, that you, to have a requirement, a male-female requirement, is unconstitutional. And then on July 15th, we've got Jazz Jennings uh, having their first uh, TV program. Do you think this is a coincidence? I think not. <laughs> right? Okay. So what was this about? Why did the revolution pivot to transgenderism after redefining marriage? Because the issue was never about marriage in the first place. The point of gay marriage was to destabilize the sex of the body, to destabilize people's sense that the sex of the body is important. And so, for the true revolutionary, the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. Always. And the revolution is always about power. That is always the purpose of every, every revolution. And so it is with this one. Now, here's the problem with the sexual revolution. We've got these three things we're trying to do. Separate sex from babies. Newsflash, sex makes babies. Okay, we got a little evidence here in front of us, right? Right? Separate sex and babies from marriage. Guess what? Kids actually do need their parents, and if you have your head, eyes open, let's put it politely, um, you will immediately see that children need their parents. And finally, duh, men and women are different. Hello? Okay, if you build your society around this, you will receive evidence of this on a daily basis. Your views will be affirmed. But with the sexual revolution, all of these things are false. Therefore, it is irrational, it is impossible, it cannot be done, and therefore, you need tons and tons of propaganda and power to make it work. And this is why you're being flooded with propaganda all the time, okay? This is why it's happening to you. The sexual revolution is a totalitarian ideology that no one should have anything to do with, okay? Now, 
The Christian sexual constitution asks this question, what is owed to children? At the Ruth Institute, we start from the premise that every person is entitled to know the identity of their parents and that every person is entitled to a relationship with both of those parents unless some unavoidable tragedy takes place, okay? So now if you start with that idea and ask yourself, well, how can we make a plan to make this happen for, for a lifetime? Well, we need a lifetime cooperation plan, and Christianity provided that with a series of prohibitions that we're so famous for and that everybody loves to hate. You shall not have sex before or outside of marriage. You shall not divorce without cause. You shall not have sperm and egg donation. And you shall not engage in petty criticism of your spouse, which was always part of the package. Right? Right? Okay. So if we put it in positive terms, get married before having sex. Only have sex with your spouse. I know this is so radical. Um, <laughs> Stay married unless somebody does something really awful. Um, be nice to your spouse. And finally, be satisfied with the children God gives you. Be satisfied. And so, therefore, that's where you end up. You start with the kids. You reason backwards, you use your old noodle to think logically for 30 seconds, you know, and you will end up with traditional Christian sexual morality. By the way, this is our little cathedral in little old Lake Charles, and you can see it's a traditional Latin mass. Yeah. <laughs> all right, y'all. So, what is the social, and you guys all know Christian sexual morality, but I want to just point out, what is the social result? What is the result for society? Okay, for every child, a mother and a father. That is a social result. No matter how rich and important and influential your family may be, no matter how poor or seemingly insignificant your parents may be, for every child, a mother and a father. In good times or in bad, a mother and a father. Black or white, a mother and a father. For our native-born people and this little old immigrant family in 1910 at Ellis Island, for every child, a mother and a father. For every man, <laughs> for every man, one and only one wife. The rich guys don't get to hog all the women. Okay, because that's what happens in polygamous societies. If you look for more than a couple generations, that's how it works, right? The rich guys hog all the women. For every woman, no matter how glamorous, no matter how beautiful, one, only one wife, husband. Sorry, whoa. <laughs> So this overall social result of traditional Christian sexual morality is for every child, a mother and a father, for every man, one wife, for every woman, one husband. This is true reproductive equality. Everybody's reproducing on the same terms. This is true justice, social justice and equality for everyone. Traditional Christian sexual morality secures this for everybody. As Christians, we believe that God created each and every person. Every person who's ever been conceived exists because God wants that person to exist. And God wants our participation in his loving plan of procreation. At the heart of the universe is a deep and abiding love. And I am not ashamed to say that this is what I believe. Thank you very much. <laughs>